My name is Lorraine Cunningham and I'm the chair of the TransLink board and I'm happy to be the speaker on behalf of all my fellow board members. Um, I'd like to welcome you to TransLink's second public board meeting of 2018. Uh, I'd like to also welcome those who are live streaming today through Facebook or Twitter. Thank you for joining us. At this point, I'd like to call our uh, today's meeting to order, and I want to acknowledge TransLink operates throughout the traditional territories of the Lower, lower Mainland Coast Salish people, um, and we are on those territories now, and we operate our systems. Specifically, this meeting is being held in the traditional territory of the Kikite First Nations. Safety here at TransLink is very important to us for all of our employees and, uh, and the public. And I just want to take a moment to remind you of the location of the emergency exits. The nearest exit is across the hall, uh, which is right here. And in the event of an alarm, please exit in an orderly fashion. You are all just to remind you on the fourth floor. And you're to meet at the muster station along the construction fence at the, uh, on the outside of the building facing the Sapperton SkyTrain station. For those using mobility devices, please do not use the elevator, but gather in the vicinity of the stairwell and, um, and we will make sure that you're taken to a safe refuge area. Our floor wardens will report your location to the fire department and they'll prioritize your safe exit from the building. In the event of an earthquake, please remember to, uh, to drop cover and hold until the shaking has stopped. Before we get started with this meeting, I'd like to take a moment to welcome back Marcella Sell to the board. She's drinking water. She wasn't expecting this. <laughs> with the departure of uh, Janet Austin, as you now all know, she, uh, Janet had her last, our, her last meeting with us at the last open board meeting, and she is now our Lieutenant Governor for the province of British Columbia. Marcella has uh, kindly agreed to come back and serve. So Marcella served six years on the board, uh, had a brief gap, and she's now agreed to come back and serve until the end of Janet's term, which is in, uh, in December of 2019. So we're very happy to have Marcella back. So thank you so much, Marcella. With that, let's begin our meeting um, with the first item on the agenda, which is our consent agenda. And, um, Sorry, I'm just uh, looking for my agenda now. Where did it go? Hold on, I have a little technical problem. So the consent agenda is um, minutes from March 28th and a response to public delegations. So any uh, comments or questions in regards to the, um, uh, to the consent agenda? If there's no objections, then uh, these items will be adopted. All right, hearing none, I, I will accept those as being adopted. The um, next item on the agenda is public delegations. We have three public delegations uh, that are here to speak to us today. And I'd like to call Ava Caldwell. Is Ava here? All right, Ava might not have been able to join us. So our next delegate is Kelly Reburn. Hi, Kelly, welcome. There's a little button on your microphone there. Okay, great. Gigi has a timer for you, and you okay? So she'll set that up for you, and then you'll um, you'll have a little warning so you know when to wrap up your remarks. Thanks very much, Kelly. Hi there, and uh, thank you for the questions on the report as well. Uh, my name is Kelly Reburn. I'm a transit rider for as long as I remember. <laughs> so, anyways. Um, Oh, I'll go back to a little bit of a history on TransLink, um, just to refresh your memory. TransLink used to be started back when BC Transit used to be uh, dismissed afterwards and became a Greater Vancouver Transit Regional System. Uh, in the past few years, uh, TransLink was also introduced uh, from Vancouver Regional Transit to the south coast of British Columbia Regional District. Uh, expanding, they were going to expand it from uh, from Hope to Pemberton for all I can remember. But obviously, uh, this TransLink has always been a, met a Metro Vancouver situation, and many of the people are very kind of disappointed about that too. So I'm I'm kind of disappointed that um, we're we're talking about Metro Vancouver instead of uh, other places like in Hope or in Mission, or in the Fraser Valley region, for that matter. Um, 
Um, so I, again, I am a public transit rider. I ride all over town <laughs> whenever I can. Um, one thing I like to do is call the uh, Tour de Lower Mainland, which is not a cycling route for that matter, but it's more like of a, a bus route that you can actually take region by region by region throughout the Metro Vancouver region. So I recommend everybody can do that um, on their spare time or anything like that. Travel all the zones um, whenever they like and uh, enjoy the scenery because summer like this can be a, a fun and easy uh, thing to travel. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, that's, that's one part of the issue. Um, a lot of people from other parts of the community, like Squamish and Whistler, is taking advantage of uh, doing stuff from work, uh, from home to the work, to the Vancouver area, and other, and again, all the pros, all this, all the um, cars and stuff are, are, well, you mentioned on the report saying about our greenhouse gas administration, the uh, the the carbon tax situation that has happened. Um, I I still would like to see more public transit service beyond Greater Vancouver Region, uh, for that matter. And of course, I do have a uh, compass card with the red. Uh, Pass with which, of course, it's all part of the bus pass program, part of British Columbia's uh, government pass. <laughs> so, um, I, and of course, I am I'm autistic person. I work a job over on Granville Fourteenth. Um, I I do I do a lot of community work <laughs> for that matter. So I do a lot of good things on on this sort of matter. And then anyways, um, just about one minute, but um, so, so just to summarize, we would like to see more people uh, to to get on board with public transit, not just in the greater Vancouver area, but in the whole uh, Vancouver and Lower Mainland region and the South Coast region in, in general, because what we're seeing now is just part of the issue that we we deal with every single day, and especially for myself as a transit rider, uh, to get around to places, even though if it's not um, a, a daily work or just for pleasure or for other places. Um, so uh, <laughs> thank you for your time and I uh, will uh, leave you for any other questions or other situations, thank you. Uh, thanks, Kelly. I just want to respond to, I think, the gist of uh, some of your remarks on the expanded territory, mm -hmm. the, the TransLink uh, service area. Um, you know, during my remarks um, in the uh, AGM a few minutes ago, I mentioned we're getting started with the uh, long-range plan. A lot of people ask us about what about services out in the Fraser Valley, what about right. services up Sea to Sky to uh, Squamish and even mm -hmm. Whistler. Um, we've had, I've had conversations with BC Transit, with the Minister of Transportation um, about those connections. Um, I, I can tell you the province is very interested in how they're going to collaborate with Translate during the long-range plan process. One of the things that I'm sure we will be looking at, and we'll be hearing a lot of feedback not only within the district but outside our district, is the extent to which should we expand the district. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, voters in those communities have to decide. Um, ultimately, in the governments in those communities, the municipal governments have to decide to join the district. But how do we further the integration mm -hmm. um, of the system um, going forward? So we're on it. We're thinking about it. Don't know where it will end up, but it is going to be part of the agenda for the long-range plan process. Okay, Tony, are you still involved in trams? The trams, the 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 transit museum archives? No. Oh, okay. For some reason, I thought you were. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, I'd like to now invite J.F. Ogilvy to come forward. <coughs> Thank you, and the timer will be set here for the five minutes, all right? Thank you very much.
my concern is whether TransLink exists for the convenience of the passengers or the passengers exist for the convenience of TransLink. Do you understand the point? All right, so let's take an example. Uh, the 135 bus, that's, I, I, took it, I, I rode it for something like 20 years and it was changed to the 95 bus. Now, my personal observations at many hours of the day and evening, early morning, is that uh, the stops that are not served now by the 95, um, they, they were formerly, almost every stop, there were, there were passengers embarking or disembarking on the, on the, on the, in Burnaby. Right. Uh, so a, a, a quick uh, calculation, a conservative number of passengers involved, a thousand passengers a day are being inconvenienced because of the change from the 135 to the 95. That's 365,000 passengers a year that, that are not being served by the stop. Well, who cares? Well, let, let them walk. Isn't that the idea? Let them walk to the, to, the, to the nearest bus stop. And who are the passengers involved? They're the, the seniors, the, 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 the elderly women, elderly men. Uh, oh, who, who cares? Oh, let them walk. So I understand there's a justification for having the 95 bus in the first half of the day, right? There are thousands of students and other employees, employees of, of Simon Fraser University that have to go there. One common destination. So between, say, 7 o'clock and, and 1, 1 a.m., 1 p.m., then, then the, there is a fine justification for the 95 bus. But after that, the minority of passengers go to the terminus. But, oh no, bureaucrats say, oh, it has to be 95, it has to be non-stop, throwing those other thousand passengers a day uh, uh, inconvenience. And, and, and don't tell me, oh, well, they can switch, shift to another bus, where they wait out in the rain or the snow for 20 minutes for the, for the 160 to come along. Why should they? When well, the bus goes right past their stop that, that they've been using for 20 years. All right, so another uh, uh, aspect, uh, the, Bus 145, right, from Simon Fraser University to Production Station. Ah, but it doesn't go to, it doesn't take the passengers to Production Station. It dumps them down on Low Heat Highway. And, and, and the bus can stay there for five minutes, obstructing a bicycle lane. How many cyclists do you have to murder because they have to swerve out into the, into the traffic on the highway? Before, before the, uh, before you, the, the, the stop is, is, is uh, terminated, dis discontinued. Why, why can't the bus go back up into, into the loop at the station, right? There's optimum, so they can, the passengers can disembark on one side and embark on the other side. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's too, 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 too complicated for the, for the planners at TransLink. So you know, it's much better to have the, the passengers walk 70 or 100 meters up the highway and then take a st staircase, no escalator, no elevator at that point, into the station. So, that, but that's, that's, you know, that it's the convenience of TransLink, not the tra convenience of passengers. The compass system. That was a, 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 a the, the, re, the reason for the compass system was to cut down on, to, to save on wages, salaries for the employees here, right? To have an automated system. And it doesn't work. We're told to tap in and tap out. It doesn't work. You have to hold it there, right? You have to hold the, the card at the thing for, for a finite interval of time. Tap in and, and tap your, uh, does the TransLink have a, have a, a, a department of, of stupid slogans that don't apply? Um, now, the, the, the idea of Compass was, was to cut down on the salaries here, right? So what does it do? It sends jobs to the US. $100 million went to, went to, to, to for, uh, to, out of the country to, 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 to pay for this system. How much, 
How much uh, uh, does it, uh, the license to use that per year, how much, uh, could you tell me how much that costs? We'd have to get back, I, I don't know that off offhand, some we can get back to you about that. I don't know. Not off. It, it's not free. I mean, you, you can't continue to use that, that, that compass system without paying that, that uh, American company so much money per year. And what about the, 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 the software for the, for the train system? Is that, was that developed here in Canada 30 years ago? You don't know about that. Somebody else might. We can look into some of this information, Mr. Ogilvie, and get back to you about that. Um, you have reached your five minutes. Or do you have a concluding remark that you'd like to make? Sorry, you finished your five minutes. Yes. Do you have a concluding remark that you'd like to make? Because we, we do need to move well, on. Well, the, 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 the optimum place for a bus to stop is at the approach side of an intersection, at the intersection. An exam a wonderful example of the stupidity of the present system is that one and the same stop has two different names depending on which bus route you're on, right? Uh, and that's at the Rosser stop, uh, it's called Rosser Street on one bus and it's called Willingdon Drive on another bus, Willingdon, right? And it's either, neither. It's part of the big lie, the tap in, tap out. No, it doesn't tap, it doesn't work. It's a big lie. And this, and and the the before the the the, the very these crude signs on the buses were put in, uh, the 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 driver got it right. He said it's Safeway. That's what there. That's where the bus stops. It doesn't stop at Rosser. It doesn't stop at Willingdon. It stops halfway in between. And it's it it uh, it's it, 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 it's nonsense. Uh, the the bus should the the optimum place for the bus to stop is at the approach side at the intersection. That happens. It happens uh, for the 95 or 135 at Main Street and at Granville. Now, in other places, the, 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 uh, if you take the 14 bus, then the driver announces before Richard Streets, this next stop is for the, for the uh, transfer to the Canada line. Or the, the, right? And, and only two blocks for the passengers to walk, and the bus goes straight past. The, the, the system is designed for the convenience of Translate, not for the convenience of passengers. So, um, Mr. Ogilvie, thanks for, the, for that feedback on the system. Mr. Cross, our uh, head of planning, is right over there. He can, um, I appreciate your feedback on some of the routing um, decisions. Um, I, I do want to assure you that um, our planners, their objective uh, when they're addressing route configurations is to create a system that maximizes the benefits for uh, most people and our ridership gains o over time, I think, um, exhibit that. So I think some of the route changes you're referring to uh, were, were implemented as part of the opening of the Evergreen Line in, in December of 2016. So Mr. Cross can, um, 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 either Mr. Cross or one of his planners uh, would be delighted to talk to you about your concerns with the routing and, and the stop spacing on the 135 and, and so forth. So Mr. Cross is over there and they'll, they'll talk to you about um, uh, your ideas and your concerns and how we can respond to that. Thank you. So the, the, the idea is for, for, for the machines in these, uh, the, there are 17 machines in the, in the airport station, right? And the cost of those machines must be at least half a million dollars between a half million and a million dollars for those machines. And you could have one person sitting up there in a, in a, in a, a ticket office, ticket kiosk, uh, serving the people. Uh, the, the machines, they don't accept $50 bills, do they? Mr. Ogilvie and Giardini has a, mo has a comment she'd like to make. I just want to thank you for the passion and the attentiveness to our system. Uh, uh, we don't get that many people that come with comments here, as you can see, just a few. And uh, I think it's great that you're um, paying attention. Uh, now, whether you'll get all the answers that, the way you want them is another question. You'll get answers. Um, and I think as a board member, I'd very much like to see the responses that are ultimately given to each of these questions. Uh, and uh, I, I thank you for your commitment to, to the system. It, it's commendable. So thank you, Mr. Ogilvie. I need to move on now, and and um, so Jeff Cross is over, and he can he can uh, help you with.
getting some more detailed answers to some of your questions, okay? Thank you very much. Um, I just want to see if Ava Caldwell has, uh, has it arrived. All right, if not, then I think that's, that completes the end of our, uh, our public delegations. And I'm going to move on now to the executive reports, which is on item, item four on our agenda. And the first item is our CEO report. So, Kevin, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, so I have a um, handful of um, reports and uh, updates. So uh, the first um, is our uh, ongoing ridership uh, story, story here, which continues to be, um, in my view, nothing short of extraordinary. I've been been at this in a variety of different places, and I, I study ridership statistics um, uh, throughout North America for a long time, but our, our trends are really um, really something. Uh, our May ridership, which we announced um, the other day, uh, was up by 9% uh, year over year, which is, is really extraordinary. Um, our, our analysts say part of that is because last May was very rainy and this May was very dry, but uh, so I guess we can add Mother Nature to um, high gas prices, uh, as well as um, I think the continued strong economy, uh, as well as the the impact of our of our service improvements. Some of the the details of that um, month to month bus was up nine and a half percent year to date. Bus ridership is up almost seven percent. Um, Handy Dart was up about um, two percent, um, and year to date I think Handy Dart is up about uh, five percent. Uh, ridership on on um, on our trains nine percent year over year in May. On Skytrain six and a half percent year to date. Canada Line up eight and a half percent month over month five point three percent year to date. West Coast Express is an interesting story. You'll recall last year West Coast Express ridership declined. We expected that with the opening of the Evergreen station because there was people could then. Um, uh, select uh, taking the train certainly from uh, Port Moody or Coquitlam instead of um, uh, the uh, instead of West Coast Express. West Coast Express ridership has bounced back and bounced back very strongly. It's, it was up 6.7 percent in May and year to date, date it's up 6.7 percent. So clearly West Coast Express has a lot of demand, a lot of interest uh, from folks and I think even as ridership was declining a little bit last year on West Coast Express in the outer um, uh, eastern stations, the, the ridership continued to grow. CBUS has been kind of a remarkable story. Ridership on CBUS in, in um, uh, May was up 13%. Year-to-date CBUS ridership is up 7.6%. Uh, 6, 6 There's no doubt uh, the, the, that the investments that we made as part of the uh, first phase of the mayor's plan um, are paying off. And I think, you know, moving to a much more frequent uh, service and what's coming with the, with the additional of, uh, vessel um, early next year, I think spells a very, very high um, expectation on continued ridership growth on CBUS. So year to date through May, overall ridership on our system is up 6.6%. So remember, it was in your remarks, last year ridership was up 5.7, that led North America. 2016 ridership was up 4.6 percent. So, uh, you know, something's happening here. I don't know how long this uh, this trend will uh, will continue, but it's it's nothing short of remarkable. And I think it it absolutely underscores uh, the wisdom uh, I think of our policymakers in moving forward with the investments um, in the Phase One plan and hopefully uh, in the Phase Two plan. If anything, let's just hurry up and get it done, uh, making it happen. We we can't keep service out there. I think is as quickly as, as the demand uh, requires. Kind of along those lines, uh, today uh, we are releasing our annual uh, transit service performance review. Um, that This report um, identifies ridership, cost, utilization, reliability on all modes um, of our service. So even uh, Mr. Ogilvie's uh, comments and his, his, his concerns about some of the routes uh, and the changes to those routes that were implemented as part of the um, uh, Evergreen uh, extension, it all plays out in that report. Importantly in, in, in this report, I think it's, it's another indication uh, that we take transparency and accountability very seriously here at, at TransLink. It's a treasure trove of data. It's available to the general public and they can see exactly what's going on on their bus route, their, uh, their, transit, uh, their transit service. Uh, one of the notable um, findings in the report, uh, back to the ridership conversation, is that we are able to identify uh, in, in a more granular sense uh, what's going on in, in the system, including our eight subregions uh, in the TransLink district. 
notably the Tri-Cities, north, northeast sector in 2017, aided and abetted by the opening of, of Evergreen, transit ridership in, increased 43%. Uh, in the Tri-Cities area. So the combination certainly of the game-changing Evergreen line, but I think as well the evidence of, of these changes in the bus routes. Uh, to reconfigure the system uh, to support the Evergreen um, service is, is absolutely paying off. South of the Fraser, uh, ridership was up 8.9% um, in, in 2017. Again, a reflection of of the, the population growth in the South of the uh, Fraser, and I think just, just uh, feeds what we have done here at TransLink to, to disproportionately prioritize the bus service increases um, south of the Fraser. We have a lot of catching up to do uh, south of the Fraser and the other suburban communities. So that 8.9% indicative. And then lastly, Ladner, South Delta, and Tawasin sub area ridership was up 11% um, last year. This is just, these are just sort of, uh, some of the nuggets um, in the report. Um, after the board meeting uh, this morning, uh, we have a media availability. Sarah Ross, you all know, is our director of uh, system planning, uh, will be leading that, uh, that briefing to, to go through the report more. And the report uh, will be posted on the website uh, today. Uh, tap to pay, I mentioned that in my uh, uh, AGM remarks. Just want to, um, uh, it's going very well. Uh, we're now, what, about almost a month um, into the tap to pay program. So far, at least, I think our, our um, pre launch marketing on the so-called card clash issue, I think has, has paid off. We're seeing so far um, a very, very modest number of people who are, are contacting us asking, um, asking to have uh, double charges reversed. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's encouraging uh, at, this point, uh, at, this point in, uh, at this point in time. We're seeing, I, I think, a very strong um, utilization of, of, the, uh, of the service. Uh, through at the beginning, by the beginning of this week, we had already uh, seen over $630,000 uh, in transactions. So that's really after about um, uh, three weeks. One of the interesting um, findings, uh, which I know that uh, our Compass team and I certainly find uh, fascinating, is uh, almost 7% of the uh, credit card transactions are with the mobile phone. Uh, and I understand that that, that is a much larger percentage of, of the taps than we would have expected or is the norm in other type of um, electronic payment uh, systems. So that's, I think to a certain degree, that's probably indicative. This is a pretty uh, tech savvy uh, part of the world. So I, you know, I uh, will continue to report out uh, on the tap to pay, but uh, uh, certainly early indications are um, that, it's, that it's being taken up in the way that we expect it. As we see what our, our continuing ridership trends are in the system, I believe that it's gonna help support rider, continue to support ridership growth particularly for um, uh, the, the uh, very infrequent potential users of transit, but even more importantly, visitors uh, to our system uh, that didn't want to have to deal with figuring out how to use our, our ticket vending machines. Um, moving on to community engagement, we've been very, very active uh, lately on a number of different uh, community engagement fronts. Uh, I mentioned the Beeline uh, program in my uh, earlier remarks. Um, we have to um, communicate, work with, collaborate, with 12 different Metro Vancouver communities uh, now in order to ensure that the launch of the uh, four B lines next year um, are a success. Um, I believe we've now been to um, every council, I'm looking for Jeff to see him nod, but I think now we've been out uh, to every council to brief them on, on the B line program um, and particularly as I uh, mentioned, um, trying to get um, their support for the speed and reliability. But we've also been doing a number of um, in-person events and, and uh, website feedback. We've done some 40 in-person events, uh, 100,000 uh, web impressions associated with the, with the Beeline engagement and some 6,000 uh, surveys. So we're, as I said before, we're an organization that wants to reach out to the public and our customers, listen and help shape uh, what, we, what we expect to be a very successful launch of the Beeline program uh, late next year. Uh, Maple Ridge Pitt Meadows Area Transport Plan, uh, we've, 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 we're beginning to step up um, that program as, uh, as well. Um, it's related to the Beeline program, it's part of what we're doing for the, um, uh, the Beeline that, that will be launched out there, but there's a broader um, uh, discussion out there about the, uh, the future state of the, uh, uh, the bus network. Um, we've had eight, presentation, uh, eight presentations to a variety of different stakeholder groups. Um, uh, nearly 1,200 completed surveys, uh, which is, I think, for those communities, represents a very good 
um, and, and um, encouraging amount of, of public participation. Uh, those findings will support the phase two of the ATP, which will begin in early uh, 2019. So uh, we're looking forward to seeing what comes of that. <clears throat> and finally, the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the transit fair review. We've just launched the final uh, phase of the fair review. Got a lot of media um, earlier this week. Uh, the final phase uh, will close out on June 29th, open uh, June 18th uh, through 29th. Uh, so far, you know, throughout the entire engagement um, process, which is going on about a year and a half, we've heard from some 55,000 people. Again, I think that's a very robust uh, feedback, and we've, we've gotten, of course, a lot of media attention with our proposals um, uh, this week. So uh, more to come on that, but I think uh, so far, the, I think the public response um, has been favorable in what we're trying to do to create a fairer, fair policy um, here. I um, want to mention as well, um, on June 6th, uh, we launched our first open innovation call. One of the things this board's been very interested in is, is for TransLink to be a thought leader, to, to, to be an innovative organization. And uh, one of the ways we can do that is reach out to innovators uh, to ask them what, we, what, can, we, what, what can they envision uh, for improving our transit system and different products in our transit system. So our very first open innovation call uh, has a theme of seamless mobility. Uh, that was feedback we received last fall when we had a, a forum, a new mobility forum, uh, we called it, and we, we uh, during the course of a day-long symposium, are reaching out to people in industry, government, academia. Uh, we forged kind of a priority uh, to focus on this so-called uh, seamless mobility. Basically, you know, how, do you, how can we evolve to a place where you have a single platform or the availability of single platforms where you can do your travel planning, your booking, and your payment all in one, uh, in, in, in one device. Uh, so we're looking forward to seeing what kind of interesting ideas emerge. Uh, the, the concept around the open innovation call is some of the new funding um, in the phase one mayor, mayor's plan would allow TransLink to help support uh, and facilitate um, uh, the rapid implementation of, of such technologies. So we'll be, of course, reporting back to the board and through the committee structure. Uh, on the results of that. We expect, uh, we have a deadline for the open innovation call on June 16th. And then finally, on May 24th, uh, the Mobility Pricing Independent Commission uh, presented its report uh, to the Mayor's Council uh, and TransLink. Um, I think we've gotten a lot of very interesting and I think useful uh, media coverage, both from uh, their, their first report in the uh, late winter and then May 24th. I think the, the direction that we've gotten from the board uh, and the mayor's is to now go back and, and uh, take into account the public feedback, take into account the findings and recommend, recommendations of the commission, um, and study what, what would be the next steps. Uh, nothing is imminent uh, in terms of, of something happening on the mobility pricing front, but I think we all know at the end of the day that we've got to figure out a way to get the most out of our very, very constrained transportation network. So we look forward to continuing uh, the dialogue on, on how to make uh, reduce congestion in our region. And that's the end of my report. Great, thank you. Any questions for Kevin Marcella? Thank you, Kevin. Uh, a question on the tap to pay. Uh, I can't do the calculation that quickly. What's the percentage using the credit card payment, whether it's by phone or direct credit card, like 1%? Um, so we have an average daily boardings in the system of about okay. uh, 1.2 million um, people use the system um, every day. So the last data I saw in the tap to pay, we were running about, um, where's Mark? Uh, I think we were running about 30,000 maybe taps and, and sort of okay. it's a 15,000 unique cards, okay. something like that okay. on, the, on the high days. It goes up and down depending on the day of the week. So it's small. It's, it's, yeah. it's expected to be small. Yeah. We want, you know, the, the vast majority of our customers, they should still get a, a compass card. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the stored value uh, features where you get your better um, discounts, your period pass, if you're a heavy user of the system, you get the better discounts. The tap to pay is normal, full, um, full fare. So it's for a certain market, maybe at this point a bit of a niche market, um, but it's an important market um, in right. terms of providing additional accessibility to our system. So do, will that lead, so if you, just a follow-on question, just a rolled question. Did, do you think that's going to lead to eliminate the elimination of cash? Yes. So I think the, um, what we're, so, in my mind, there's two objectives um, of our tap-to-pay strategy. 
Um, objective one is simply customer service. You know, how can we provide better accessibility to more people that can help drive ridership and, and market share? Absolutely. But it's also the bridge to what's coming next. You know, this, this, don't quote me on this prediction, <laughs> even though it's a public meeting. But, you know, within 10 years, no one's going to be building um, uh, standalone systems like Compass anymore. Right. Um, you know, the days of that are very much numbered. The systems now that entities, transit systems throughout the world who are starting to think about what comes next for their ticketing system is something called account-based systems, where everything happens in the cloud, you won't need your closed system like Compass. Now, we have a system that works very well. It is the state of the art uh, at this point in time, but our mobile payments is that bridge to what's coming next. So as we see um, the use of the mobile payments coming forward, we're going to start thinking about what's the next step for that, and that might be moving into more an account-based uh, system. Once we get there, you know, the dream of people like me, we've been dreaming about this for a long time, is to go cashless. The challenge with cat, I mean, you know, something like 96, 95 percent of all of our transactions today are on Compass devices. So, not a lot of our customers are still using cash uh, in the fare box. How do we get to completely cashless um, operations? A could save money, provides different customer benefits, but the other side of the coin is the equity issue, the social equity issue. People that just don't have the money to prepay for fares that are maybe um, they don't have credit cards and debit cards, uh, the unbanked. Population, So I think that's the struggle um, in our industry. If you go cashless, how do you deal with social equity? A couple of transit systems um, in the United States are beginning to think about. I think Boston has set a fairly ambitious goal by, I think, 2021 to go completely cashless. If they get there, they might be the leader in that, in, in that equation. But it is something that, that uh, we're thinking about here. Thank you. Tony. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I think one of the other benefits of the tap to pay, which I've seen at the airport, is that the customer service agents prior to this were spending most of their time sort of walking people through buying the tickets. I think now with the tap to pay, they have much more time freed up to deal with other customer service issues, which I think is a, a huge benefit. Absolutely. You know, we've worked um, on the launch of the tap to pay. We reached out to and have been working very closely with, with YVR and with the um, uh, Vancouver Visitors Association. So it's sort of both nodes, the airport and the passenger ship terminal. You've got all those, those customers. But at, at YVR, you know, we've seen stories, we've seen pictures of you know, people lining up at the ticket vending machines. So more and more, if we can, working with YVR, when visitors are coming in uh, through YVR, that they understand, here's an, a, a tool. You don't have to worry about figuring out our, our vending machines just have to go. And, you know, I think hopefully that can encourage that many more people to uh, take Canada Line and not worry about a cab or, or some other way to get uh, from the airport downtown. Great, thank you. All right, well, hearing no further questions, I'm going to call Dan Savisky up, the Acting President General Manager for Coast Mountain Bus Company, to provide his report. Welcome, Dan. Good morning. Uh, I have some uh, updates uh, that I'd like to provide for the board. Technology is going to work here. Dan, that's a test of any acting president of CNBC <laughs> is how to use the clicker yet. <laughs> you had the wrong one. <laughs> Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Another problem solved. Okay, so uh, updates uh, a little bit on safety, environment, uh, our bike patrol, uh, an update on our double-decker buses, and the state of Surrey CNG, and of course we'll finish up with uh, an update on our additional C bus. In the first part of 2018, we've seen some very encouraging trends on four key, key safety uh, indicators. Uh, you see little snapshots there, graphs on operator assaults, which are at an all-time low. Lost time claim uh, frequency uh, is uh, trending down for us. Onboard injury claims are down for the first time in several years and cyclist in injuries are continuing to drop. 
Uh, the actions that uh, we've been taking uh, by the company in each of these areas that have contributed to this trend uh, include our ongoing violence uh, incident prevention training for the operators, uh, focused uh, prevention campaigns on slips, trips and falls for both customers and employees, and also awareness sessions with our managers and operators. Uh, and also subject matter expert working groups. Uh, we've had specific committees formed in, uh, in some of these areas and they have been able to put together specific action plans to address uh, some of the uh, concerns in these areas. Uh, this also relates to, to the next slide. Uh, an update is, is on the safety management system. Uh, we have we started uh, the implementation of our uh, SMS based on the OHSAS 18001 standard. Uh, at this point, the uh, maintenance department, uh, maintenance division is complete. The uh, program is uh, up and fully running. Uh, the operations uh, component is uh, in progress. The safety management system uh, is really a business program in which safety risks are identified, quantified and mitigated through appropriate policies, processes and procedures. Uh, the program also includes uh, committing to continual improvement, which relates to the previous slide and the KPIs. Just for uh, reference, the OHSAS uh, stands for Occupational Health and Safety Assessment Series. It is a British standard uh, recognized around the world and was the starting point for the new ISO safety standard. Um, uh, this year, TransLink Internal Auditing uh, Group will perform a gap analysis of the SMS at CNBC against the newly created ISO 45001 standard. Uh, following that gap analysis, CMBC will develop an action plan to bring the SMS into compliance with the new ISO standard. On the environmental side, uh, our spills per million kilometer uh, is tracking very well. As of the end of Q1, we were at 5.2, which is well below our target of 7.9. This reduction is due to the implement, implementation of many continuous improvement initiatives. Uh, these ini initiatives focus on eliminating the root causes of spills uh, on a series of buses, and, including new buses when they are commissioned. Uh, we also have a couple of PowerSmart uh, retrofit projects that are going on at two of our transit centers. Uh, at the Richmond Transit Center, which was completed March 31st, uh, we expect annual energy savings of over 592 megawatt hours of electricity and over 2,000 gigajoules of natural gas. Uh, this uh, equates to about 125 tons of greenhouse gas savings for us. The lighting portion of the retrofit at uh, Richmond Transit Center provided electrical savings of 600 megawatt hours uh, since its completion in June of 2017. This is enough electricity to power about 55 homes for an entire year. The retrofit to the Vancouver Transit Centre are still in progress. Uh, the lighting retrofits uh, were also completed March 31st and have saved about approximately 200 megawatt hours of electrical savings uh, since uh, the beginning of the year. Annually, we expect to save over 1,400 megawatt hours per year, or 28 uh, percent, which is enough to power 135 homes. Uh, the other retrofits, once complete, are also expected to reduce our natural gas consumption uh, by about 23 percent, or 6,000 gigajoules per year. Uh, based on positive feedback from our customers and operators, the Transit Security Bike Patrol Unit has returned for its fourth year, and we have increased the number of officers from four to eight. The main purpose of the Bike Patrol is to uh, increase the opportunity for face-to-face -face interaction with customers and bus operators. They improve our customers' experience by answering questions during the busy summer tourist season, 
and their presence helps our customers and employees feel safer. The bike patrol can be found in the downtown Vancouver and Surrey Central areas, and they are uh, there from May through October, seven days a week. Our double-decker pilot uh, was uh, completed successfully on March 16th, and the feedback from our customers and employees was very positive. We are proceeding with the procurement of 32 double-decker buses and the request for proposals closed May 4th. 27 of the buses that are on, what will be ordered shortly are for replacements of our 2001 Orion coaches and the other five will be for service expansion. Uh, this is also the first time that we have done a joint procurement with BC Transit. So, uh, they have actually participated in our RFP and on our evaluation teams, and this will give them the option to pre place their own separate order for buses in addition to the 32 that we will be ordering. Uh, funding for the double-decker buses has already been secured, and if all goes uh, as planned, uh, we should see deliveries starting in mid-2019. We have 106 new CNG buses that have started arriving for the Surrey Transit Centre. A media event was held on May 15th to share this news with customers. The Transit Centre underwent two years of construction to be capable of handling the CNG buses, which included a new CNG fueling sa station. These are also the first uh, of our new buses to include the factory installed operator protection barrier. Once all the buses are in service, more than half the buses in the Surrey fleet will be new, providing a new or a better customer experience. Uh, eight of these buses are already in service today. Um, previous to the delivery, we had 146 CNG buses in our fleet operating out of Poco and Hamilton. With the addition of these new buses, just over half of our conventional bus fleet will run with clean energy, and will, which includes uh, our, our electric trolley buses, uh, the other CNG buses, and the hybrid diesel buses. Uh, the cost of purchasing the new CNG buses is offset by contributions from Fortis BC through its natural gas for transportation uh, vehicle incentive program. So lastly, on the additional CBUS, uh, we had a major milestone in May. Uh, the three main components of the vessel were being built in three separate uh, um, uh, facilities, and uh, those sections were uh, brought together. And so we actually have something that looks like a, uh, a vessel now. The project remains on budget, and vessel delivery uh, is now targeted for the end of uh, Q1 in 2019, with commissioning in Q2. Uh, the next couple of slides are just a series of pictures that shows this is the hull section uh, being turned over. It was built upside down. Uh, the hull gets flipped over. This is the passenger section, which was barged over to the facility uh, and gets lowered in place. And then, of course, the wheelhouse assembly was dropped uh, on lastly. So the, the components were then taken back inside the facility where they will be, uh, the rest of the construction will be uh, completed. Uh, so that's the end of the updates that I have. Thank you, Dan. Smart guy to put some cool pictures in there. We like that. <laughs> Okay, any questions for Dan? Anne. Thanks for your report, Dan, um, and thank you for stepping into this role as well. Uh, I uh, wondered, I have a couple questions. One, first of all, is I noticed you have the, the folks doing the bike patrol, a uh, fabulous idea. I like the high vis vests. Uh, what's, who do you hire, and is there a diversity in the hiring? Do you have any sense? Um, we have uh, um, di some diversity within that group. Uh, they are existing uh, security officers that are redeployed for the bike patrol. Um, you know, so as we go through our hiring process, uh, you know, we are definitely working with human resources on the diversity side of things. Do you have any sense of 
how diverse that work that those that roles those roles uh, are. No, I'm sorry, I don't have to, numbers on. Yeah, it'd be great to head. see a, a focus because they're temporary okay. roles to make sure that those roles really reflect the diversity in the community because they're working in the community. I think they're. It would be great to see the community eyes see people that that look like them. I don't know that think that that's possible if you're hiring from within an existing workforce, but it'd be great to see that. My other comment was on your safety trends slide. Uh, I think I'd like to see that again, but with the trends reflecting all the same period of time, because the arrows didn't all go back to the start. And uh, so I don't know if you want to do it for next time, but I, I'd like to make sure those trends are all measured over the exact same period of time so we get a true sense of how the trends are reflected over time. Uh, and uh, my third comment and last one is I thought the joint procurement idea with uh, BC Transit is, is excellent and a great, op a great example of striving to um, find efficiencies. Thank you. Thank you. Marcella. I just want to echo the comments on your focus on safety. Thank you for that. It's very important. Um, my second question, you in, in your report that we read, you had a lot of information on the changes that you've made around access to transit, specifically related to customer things such as communication, etc. What kind of feedback have you been getting from the customers on the changes that you've been made? Um, Marcel, if I could just interrupt, we we yeah. have. So Hayden is going to come up actually okay. in the in the sort of changes with Dan uh, taking over. Uh, interim at CNBC and Hayden as interim at BCRTC. Hayden actually, because of the transfer to First Trans on July 1st, Hayden wanted to, con and I agreed, um, Hayden would continue to oversee the, the, um, uh, the Handy Dark piece with Louise Hardy. So actually when Hayden comes up in just a minute, redirect that question to Hayden. And I think Louise is actually going to come up with, with Hayden as well, actually talk about some of that stuff. Thank Not you. that Dan doesn't know what's going on either, but it's you guys. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a special it's a special section on the agenda. Uh, Karen. Yeah, Dan, thank you very much, and thanks again for the um, for the emphasis on safety. I just have a question about the operator protection uh, barrier uh, retrofit program. Um, will you be also looking at the signage that um, I think there's some signage on the buses that says something about. Um, uh, uh, assaults on operators won't be tolerated, something along those lines. I wonder if there could be a stronger message, and I wonder if that's part of the, uh, the retrofit program. Uh, there was uh, uh, no built-in uh, plan to look at that wording, but it's certainly something that can be uh, added in. Uh, the retrofit, uh, you know, we have new buses uh, that are coming with the barriers, but we are, by the end of the year, looking to start the retrofit fit program on all of the uh, AC equipped uh, coaches within the fleet. Yeah, because just given everything um, that we've, all of the emphasis that we've had on on making sure our operators are safe, I just wondered if we could, it might be worth looking at the wording and uh, potentially a stronger, I would say, much stronger message. Yeah. 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 I think we can, we can work with transit police and communications yeah. to get that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Karen. And Murray. Uh, thank you, and thanks for the report. Just uh, on the um, table that uh, talks about operating cost per vehicle kilometer, um, the difference in the um, regular transit system, of, it looks like um, six cents per vehicle kilometer. I'm just curious about that. It's uh, over our target for the year. Uh, do you have any explanation for that? Um, uh, you know, we, there's been, uh, certainly with, uh, with the bad weather at the beginning of the year, you actually do see some higher operating costs uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, a lot of times we see this stuff normalize, normalize out as we go through the rest of the year. Okay, because I see the, the, uh, in the uh, handy dart area, it's also uh, higher cost per, per vehicle kilometer as well. So they're kind of complementary in terms of the percentage increase. Um, but it's a two percent, roughly two percent increase over projections, which, you know, taken out over the course of the year could be quite significant to budget. So, uh, um, it is doesn't relate to fuel price increases. I understand we buffer that by hedging our, our fuel uh, purchases. Uh, yes. So I'm. Uh, it may be appropriate to send something out if you could uh, send something out to the board that documents why that um, difference exists. Murray, I, I, I would note, I think, as I read this, while the, um, uh, the April numbers um, 
might have trended higher. I think their year to date in both Handy Dart and Fixed Route Bus are below their annual target at this point. Okay. Dan, I think you might be off the hook. I actually have one maybe trick question for you. <laughs> you mentioned about the CNG and the differential and the cost of the CNG buses and how that's being supported by some some additional mon funding uh, money. What is the difference between the cost of a diesel bus versus a CNG bus? Uh, the, the actual, the differential cost has actually come down to be quite nominal uh, these days. Uh, the additional CNG system, uh, depending upon the order, can be in the $20,000 to $30,000 uh, range uh, per vehicle. So, and those costs are, are significantly covered with the incentives from Ford's. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Dan, you're off the hot seat, and I'm now going to invite Hayden up. So Hayden, I assume that you now have Louise with you that you're going to do the item 6.5 on the agenda now? Yes, on the handy order. Okay, and then you'll move on to the BCRTC report? That's right. Okay, great. Thank you. We have a slide for handy dark though. We're separate report. This is just their routine. Okay. Okay. We have a handy dark slide. I'm not sure where it is. So just bear with me for a second. So um, Kevin says you're not doing handy dart right now. You're doing no, no, no. That, that's a different report. The six. Oh, okay, okay. Is the custom transit policy stuff? Oh, okay. The handy dart operation. Okay, sorry, Hayden. Take it away. So Louise, our director of access transit, responsible for service uh, delivery. Uh, our focus and the slide, which has gone missing, but we'll speak to it, is really presentation today is to focus on our transition from the NB contractor to first transit. Six month transition period started at the beginning of the year in January. We're 10 days to the rollover. It all happens at midnight, the end of June, going into July uh, 1st. A lot of moving pieces. <clears throat> we were concerned about it. Our focus was 100% seamless to the customer. So Sunday, the customer will see the same thing as they see on Monday. That was our goal as we went through. Number of moving uh, pieces we put together. Uh, steering committees, working groups, uh, executive steering committee, which I sat on, we uh, met regularly uh, with the senior executives of both First Transit and MB. I can say that both companies, one giving up the contract and one uh, receiving the contract, very cooperative uh, going forward. We transferred employees over, uh, we transferred collective agreements, they negotiated a one-year collective agreement for the employees. Training on the technical side, uh, every one of the 350 some odd vehicles uh, on the night of June 30th have to be transferred with new licenses. Uh, we own the vehicles at Translink, but of course the insurance uh, falls to uh, the contractor. So just a number of uh, items there for us to uh, cover off. <clears throat> uh, the new contractual agreement, as I mentioned, uh, for the employees, uh, one year term starting on July 1st. We're uh, pleased uh, with that. Uh, all but 20 of the existing uh, employees at MV have moved over to First Transit. That is terrific for our, our customers because uh, most of those are the operators and drivers very really pleased about that. Uh, they, uh, First Transit has put enhanced training for all uh, the employees to meet their standard. They have a real focus on uh, the customer and they put, uh, they're almost completed with uh, all the training for those customers so we're very uh, pleased with that. I'm going to uh, have uh, a uh, Louise talked a little bit about the call center and taxi and, and those issues. Sure. So the call center uh, is being operated by First as of July 1st. They do. They will handle the, ha the booking, dispatching, scheduling of the trips. And we provided them early access to our software, the Trapeze software. And they had an expert um, in Trapeze go through all the parameter settings to fine tune it um, we hope to see better scheduling, better on-time performance from the tinkering that they've been able to do with that. And regarding taxi, uh, First Canada will assume the taxi contracts. Today, taxi, uh, MV has service agreements with the taxis, so they've got an agreement with the taxi companies to carry on with that temporarily. And we have engaged 
um, industry professionals to work with us. We've had two sessions with them and they're assisting us with the structure of new contracts with the taxis that will focus on customer service with some performance levers, similar to what we did with the contract with FIRST. And um, FIRST Canada is bringing a two positions that are new to us. One is a manager that will oversee the taxi service that they provide for Handy Dart, and one is a taxi trainer position. And First Canada is also taking over the Taxi Vest program that we trialed um, earlier this year with two taxi companies. They will roll that out to all taxi companies. And Coast Mountain Buses? Okay. Uh, we, uh, Coast Mountain Bus arranged two open houses for customers to come and meet the first transit management. We had those two sessions here in this room on June 1st, one in the morning and one in the evening. And it was to interact with uh, my team, Access Transit Service Delivery, and they had the opportunity to meet the first Canada reps and provide feedback. We had a bunch of easels throughout the, the room. We're listing some of the improvements we've done recently and provided the customers some yellow stickies to put on the boards to provide feedback. We got a lot of feedback from that. There were over 100 customers attended and some of the stakeholders as well from the health authorities, etc. Mm -hmm. That's it for me. Are you done? I believe so. I have a final comment, but uh, if there's any questions first. Any questions? Oh, Jim. <coughs> So a couple of questions. One on the uh, taxi service, because in the past we've had complaints from people who say that the service hasn't been up to standard. And uh, you know, is there any discussion about any rating system for the trip that someone just took? Um, very similar to like an Uber trip where you get a text saying fill out the form right away or something online. Um, that way you get immediate feedback on performance. And my second question relates to the denial rate. And I noticed that it's quite uh, low and driven down substantially so obviously some improvements were made to uh, improve on that trip denial rate so those are my two questions okay. uh, for taxi service I would love something like what uber has we don't have anything in the works for that right now but we are exploring an immediate taxi survey with each customer 75% um, of it would be an automated phone survey and the other 25% would be an actual phone call with a rep and that's actually in process right now to implement that. We're just starting with that. Um, and on the denials, the denials in 2012-2013 were enormous. Annual denials in 2013 were around 42,000 and a decision was made to increase the um, use of taxis. So the use of taxis went from around 21,000 per year in 2012 up to 129,000 trips last year. And the increase in taxi allows us to keep the denials very low. Denials are near zero per day. Does that help? That answer your questions? The customers are extremely happy. We did get some negative um, comments around on, on some of the easels, but overall the customers are, are very positive. I'm not sure if Beth McKellar is here, but she was, she was very appreciative. She came to the open house and was very appreciative for what we're doing, practically gushing about how, uh, how happy she is. <coughs> Sorry. I just wanted to remember you saying um, the complaints um, appeared to be elevated when uh, TransLink took over the uh, responsibility for responding to customer concerns and complaints. And I'm wondering how that's trending now. It's trending the same. The, the, I don't believe there is anything different that's happened. I just believe it was in how they were being recorded. So are the complaints trending down now as a result of the improvements that are being made? Or are we uh, The still? taxi complaints have absolutely trended down. Okay. The, 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 all the other complaints are, 
around the same as they were when we started taking over. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I just have, in regards to taxis, given that they deliver you know, a, a large number of service, did we sort out an ID for um, when the taxis arrive in regards to identifying the vehicle? I know you said you had vests. There's two things. Customers can sign up for notifications, which is a phone call. They can pick which phone number they want it to go to on each leg of the trip, and the phone call will advise them of an imminent arrival of the vehicle. It'll tell them if it's going to be a taxi. And then we trialed the, the vest program. The vest, um, the taxi drivers wear the, a high-vis vest, has a Handy Dart logo on it, says Handy Dart right across the back. And the drivers, the two companies who are participating, the drivers said they, they love it. It helps them in the high volume locations meet up with the customer. And the customers um, are all getting a phone call when the ones that drive in those taxis or ride in those taxis. And they're also providing positive feedback. Great. Thank you very much. Karen. Just a little comment. I just wanted to say that I think the, the vest idea is just fantastic. So it makes it easier for the taxi driver, but also for the customer. Right. And it's not for everyone. It, it doesn't work for the visually impaired customers, but it's an added bonus to help them meet up. Yeah, and just for someone to feel safe. Yeah. All right. Hey. So I'm just, uh, if I can just ask for a moment, I want to thank. Louise, she's announced her retirement. She's leaving us in early uh, July. We're going to uh, miss her. I remember when Kevin first had the discussion with me about creating this position, the focus uh, that he, he wanted, the attention that was needed, somebody to uh, dig right in there. We talked about skill sets required. Louise's name first came to mind, uh, approached Kevin about Louise. We asked Louise if she was interested. She said yes, she was. She hit the ground running. I think Kevin. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll support that. She did a tremendous job. She's raised the bar for sure on Handy Dart going forward in a better place today uh, than we were before she started. And I want to thank you, Louise. We're going to miss you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Job well done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Louise. Thank you. All right. So you, yeah. yes, but Hayden gets to stay. I get to stay. Okay. Thank you, Hayden. So I'm surprised I'm here, but I'm pleased I'm here. Well, given that you announced your retirement, but you're still here, I'm we're still happy here. about that. Maybe you could do the same thing with Louise. Let's, let's, let's hope so. Uh, interesting uh, coming over just from a leadership perspective uh, before I uh, begin. So uh, BCRTC, the rail company, a number of leadership changes in, in the organization, certainly the president, uh, leadership change at maintenance. A couple of key uh, director roles in, in safety and customer performance uh, acting positions there. Anytime you have that number of changes to an organization, it puts strain on the organization. Uh, Kevin and I and Vivian uh, had many discussions before Vivian uh, departed. Uh, I certainly committed to and uh, commit to all of you here about consistency going forward and stability uh, for, for the organization as we transition once again when I leave and uh, the successor uh, comes in. Having said that, uh, it's certainly not a caretaker uh, position for me. There are a number of significant uh, projects out there. Uh, Vivian and I spent uh, a number of hours uh, doing uh, transitioning on, on some of the items. My number one focus, as it always is, but uh, once again, is uh, safety for the organization. I'm going to touch on it on my first uh, slide. Uh, the SMS system, the frontline safety program, is in uh, dire needs of a refreshment. Uh, some uh, renewed energy and, and focus. Uh, Vivian hired a consultant firm, I'll talk about that, and so that is certainly uh, one of our uh, priorities uh, going forward. Uh, we are under uh, budget uh, challenges uh, going into 2018. Um, I haven't presented those challenges to Kevin or to Rob at this point. Uh, not only are we challenged in maintenance for the budget in 2018, but we're challenged going forward into 2019. I'm very concerned about it. I've got a deep dive uh, going into the maintenance organization. We're going from the top to the bottom uh, to go through it, uh, to look at if there's uh, some mitigating uh, strategies uh, going forward on it, but I'm, I'm, uh, we're, we're working on that, and it, it's our goal to maintain the mandate that we've been given, and that is to uh, maintain our budgets going uh, forward. So we have a lot of work ahead of us in the next uh, few months as we uh, deep dive in that. We have the delivery of the Mark III uh, trains and I'll speak a little bit about that. That's exciting. Uh, we're, we're looking uh, forward uh, to that. 
We have a new director position uh, that Kevin and, and Vivian put together just to focus on the capital projects uh, within uh, the rail company, a significant number of uh, projects. It needs special attention. It's a very good position. I'm very enthused about it, and we're working uh, with our, our new director now as we uh, build the org chart and uh, put some milestones and timelines uh, going forward. Also concerned, uh, since I arrived, we've only been there a month, we've had a number of uh, incidents. We've had uh, switch failures, as you know. We've had some uh, incidents with uh, maintenance uh, vehicles on the track. Uh, so we've uh, done a deep dive. Uh, we're doing a full investigation into that, uh, looking at best practices uh, going forward. Um, so it's a, it's a busy place. Uh, we're going to do our very best. At the same time as I, I open with continuity and stability, very important. Uh, going forward. A great staff there. They have the same passion uh, that the folks at the bus company. I was very pleased about that. They take a lot of pride in their work. They're frustrated uh, at, at times with the breakdowns. They work very, very hard at maintaining a, a high on-time uh, performance, but I'm very pleased to see the passion uh, that they all have uh, going forward. On uh, safety, Uh, Vivian had hired uh, Price Waterhouse uh, Cooper to uh, do a uh, overview revision uh, to the safety management uh, system. Uh, the report came out uh, early this year. I have uh, sat through a couple of the uh, pre presentations, one uh, with Vivian. It was a, it's a very high level plan. It has 12 initiatives. It's a very, very uh, high level. And our goal now is how do we take this high level plan and bring it right down and start implementing it uh, going forward. Uh, we're working out some timelines, but just to give you a very high-level uh, overview, uh, in the one-year mark from now, we, we plan to roll out a completely revised SMS uh, program to the front line. That's where our focus is from the bottom uh, moving up. And then after three, uh, three years, uh, it's, it's our uh, hope that we will be able to apply for ICE ISO uh, certification, which is a world uh, standard. We believe we can get there. It's an aggressive uh, plan to do, but it's a good one for the organization uh, to uh, focus on. Uh, it's uh, the three-year work plan is to uh, have SMS to the ISO 45001 standard, which is the new 2018 uh, ISO standard. I uh, talked about uh, ridership. I don't want to duplicate uh, what you've uh, already heard. Uh, I have Q1 numbers. You've heard uh, main numbers, uh, all trending in a, in a very uh, positive way. So Q1 on Expo and Millennium line up 5.2%. For the quarter in May, as you heard, it went up 5.7. Uh, West Coast Express Q1 was 3.5 in May, 6.7. So significant increases in ridership. Uh, On-time performance is 95.98, which is a slightly above our target of 95.4. Uh, Universal Fair Gate Access Program, uh, you're well aware of that. I just want to give you an update on how we're progressing. Uh, we have all of Expo and Millennium Line stations done with the exception of Granville, so that's a significant progress uh, going forward. On Canada Line, we have four stations now done. We have uh, Vancouver City Centre, Yale Town, King Edward, and Langara 49th. All should be completed by the end of 2018. Very aggressive and a good news story that it looks like we're on time. Metro Town, <coughs> sorry, Metro Town uh, Station upgrades. Uh, the new and improved Metro Town Station is uh, three station houses, a rebuilt east and center, and a new west side station house. The uh, rebuilt east station house opened in March of last uh, of March of this year, uh, and the center station was uh, March of uh, 2017, followed by in July the west. We now have eight new escalators, four up and four down, three new elevators, and a new secured bike parking. It's important for our maintenance folks to have me report that we do work very hard on state of good repair. There are times when there's delays and it looks like we're not, but they work very, very hard on that. That's a bit of a technical uh, slide for you, but it just gives you a sense of uh, what they're doing on, uh, on state of good repair. We often get sidetracked because we have repairs that we didn't plan on plan to schedule maintenance, but they work very hard at uh, doing this, and these all result in less failures at downline. Our Mark III uh, delivery, first of the 14 new Mark III trains are, are ordered. It's, uh, the, the first one will arrive in September. It undergoes about three or four months testing. We hope to have it in service by uh, December. And I learned, and I think perhaps you know this, but you didn't know, so when we say 
train, one train represents four cars. And uh, <clears throat> so we plan that once the first delivery comes in on service in December that we should deliver a train once a month and everything should be in place by early 2019. Been a lot of discussion at the board meetings over uh, the last while on the noise complaints and the track noise complaints. So we've set up a, a working group uh, focused really in, in two areas, uh, two-pronged approach. One is to assess noise that's been reported in 30 locations. And secondly, we want to work closely with community advisory uh, committees and to work with our stakeholders uh, to understand the noise and what we can do about it. We will report in more detail at the next board meeting on our progress uh, to date, but just wanted to share that with you that uh, uh, we put a lot of focus on that going forward. And uh, finally, I just want to uh, recognize uh, some of our employees, Transit Police, uh, uh, recognize uh, employees through awards to identify staff and community members of outstanding acts of courage, compassion, and commitment to the safety transit uh, system. Via SkyTrain employees were recognized for assisting Transit Police with an arrest, providing life-saving medical assistance, disarming a violent individual and assisting a customer through a mental health situation. So we want to congratulate Jim, Ronnie, Ron, Joseph and Roger for these awards. And that's my report. Thank you, Hayden. Any questions for Hayden in regards to his report? I know you've got a lot on your plate and you're transitioning in yep. and we hope you stay for a very long time, Hayden. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, Anne. The um, Federal Transportation Agency in the U.S. has recently done a survey of safety standards and blind spots and areas where the standards don't address specifically related to transit. Uh, and uh, I, I'll send it to you. I, I commend it as reading for actually anyone involved in the organization. Um, my concern is also with the, with the, the comprehensive having related to transit and other spots that we don't necessarily rely solely on it. And I think I will have my second answer for you. As you go through it, you'll, you'll find out how it works. Um, but the report does identify a few blind spots that, that we may want to be cognizant of them in the past group. So I have vision for the nature that we don't use them on the hill, relying solely on the same The first water house. Cooper report focused us on, on ISO 45000, that's why we did that. Mike Richard, I don't know if Mike's still here, our VP of Operations was at the APTA conference. Uh, he reported to us yesterday there was, uh, there was quite a bit on, on train control and that, so uh, be interested to hear the report and, and uh, we'd be very interested in that. There's, there's a lot happening in that, that area. Yeah, very, it's all very good. Yeah. Well, we have a very large system, and I know it takes a lot to keep everything running, and uh, we appreciate all your all your efforts. If there's no other questions. Oh, Murray? Just, uh, one question. Okay, just, uh, with respect to West Coast Express, are we um, uh, experiencing any delays as a result of uh, heavy rail traffic interfering with uh, West Coast Express? I don't have the stats in front of me. We did. Uh, we, we did take a bit of a hit uh, because of some, some of the, the rail issues, I understand. In the last month or so, everything's back up to normal. So it's uh, it's it it appears to be uh, a normal operation without there being concerns with the. Uh, on the last delays. report I had, which was a couple of days ago, in the last okay. month we did have some hiccups in February. I can I can get that report All for right, you. Thank you. The, you know the the real significant problems we had um, in the November December period. Um, I think there were some unusual things going on with CP A and B. Uh, once they understood that this region would not accept uh, the performance that we were getting out of CP, really since then they've <clears throat> they've improved dramatically. Yeah. So I think the, the ridership gains on West Coast Express and the customer satisfaction <coughs> data, by the way, it it, op it it went down a lot because of the the pretty bad performance. It's gone right back up. Uh, so I think in yes. general the types of delays are a little bit more of the it happens every once in a while, but nothing significant. So um, I think CP has stepped up and they, they understand it's a priority for this region. Great. Good, thank you. Hayden, thank you very much. I'd like to invite Deputy Chief Mike Cumberworth up um, to give the report on behalf of the Transit Police. Welcome.
And Mike, can you just remember to hit the, uh, the button on your microphone so that it comes on? Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. So I am uh, here to present today to the board uh, on behalf of Chief Lepard, who's away on business. Uh, in my presentation, I'll provide a brief update on our live exercise event, RC Something Say Something, uh, text app, our award ceremony, and an update on our strategic plan. Uh -huh. uh, so the live exercise occurred April 16th and 18th to cover two uh, different shifts of uh, police officers. It was developed in partnership with BCRTC and West Coast Express and the purpose of the exercise was to increase the knowledge and confidence of our sergeants and acting sergeants when responding to a high, uh, a high risk incident. A large number of enterprises or enterprise representatives and external stakeholders as you'll see on the screen were involved in both the planning and the execution of the event and which led to its success. Uh, the exercise began shortly after the last West Coast Express train arrived and all passengers disembarked and then social media messages began early in the morning just advising commuters that a training exercise uh, would be occurring throughout the day. So on day one, uh, a media event was scheduled at Waterfront Station to, just to describe the purpose of the exercise and to allow the media to film a short portion of the scenario and then uh, our new media relations officer, Sergeant Clint Hampton, uh, provided a synopsis uh, to the media of what they were filming, along with just a short explanation of our police tactical response. Uh, the resulting coverage on major uh, networks, which included CBC, CTV, and Global, was very positive indeed. So the uh, exercise itself is simulated uh, injuries, deaths, and the taking of hostages on a West Coast Express train. And our officers were required to establish an incident command center to contain the suspects, uh, evacuate transit passengers and staff, extract the wounded, and negotiate with suspects. Uh, Post-exercise analysis and findings are now being used to help us plan a subsequent exercise in the fall, uh, which will involve all of our patrol constables in reacting similarly uh, to a critical incident of this nature. The new uh, transit safety brochures have been designed and they're in the process of being printed for distribution at our community events this summer. Uh, they include key safety tips such as the use of our 877777 text service, our contact number, access to a, a yellow emergency strips on the trains and intercoms at the stations, uh, information on what to report to the police when somebody uh, witnesses an event or a criminal act is listed in the brochure such as uh, the train number, bus number that, that they're on, their current location, a description of the suspect and so on. Uh, there was a 6% six per, six increase in text reporting in 2017 uh, compared to 2016, which speaks to the success of the uh, tech service. Uh, the brochures provide an opportunity as well to take advantage of our branded sub-offices, both at Broadway Commercial and Surrey Central, uh, to set up brochures, uh, brochure stands just to distribute uh, the safety literature during the rush hour uh, periods. We've also reached out to our key stakeholders, um, which includes Surrey Crime Prevention Society and IRL, We've discussed with them uh, using their resources uh, to hand out the same brochures at major hubs. Uh, as Hayden uh, commented on, on April 18th, we hosted our award ceremony in recognition of exemplary service by both Transit Police and TransLink Enterprise staff in support of the police. So some of the examples of uh, accommodations for our police officers included an officer who was dragged by a vehicle in a park and ride when he tried to stop an intoxicated driver from leaving with a child in the back seat, and then a sergeant who successfully talked a distraught male away from the edge of a cliff who was intending to jump. And uh, as you may, or as you did hear from Hayden, uh, there were also commendations uh, to enterprise staff, which Hayden's commented on. I'll add one additional one uh, was the work done by a uh, staff member to review hours of CCTV footage to assist us in the apprehension of a suspect in a serious, serious sexual assault. Uh, we released a report to the public highlighting updates to our strategic plan. 
the three strategic plan objectives are for us a safe and secure transit system, confidence in the use of the public transit system, and regional services to enhance local policing and community safety. So the report includes key actions uh, which were highlighted within the report and this includes the full implementation of the Evergreen Extension Safety and Security Planning in cooperation with the RCMP and Coquitlam uh, or sorry, the Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam, RCMP and the Port Moody Police Departments. Uh, we also delivered training on the HOT principle and training in de-escalation techniques to enterprise employees. Increased the number of community outreach events which our officers provided or attended to provide uh, and promote uh, safety. Uh, 409 events in 2017 up from 145 in 2016. And increased dog uh, team security sweeps with door, with four dog teams uh, operational on the system. Soon there will be six. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mike? I'm sure Jim Chu has one. <laughs> um, Mike, I'm interested in the number of officers that were involved in the exercise that you ran. Approximately 20 to 25, uh, both sergeants and acting sergeants, and then uh, we had our negotiators involved as well. So, Okay, great. And so then the next round you'll do a different group that will be running through the exercise? Okay. So the, the next round will involve all of our constables, so the, our, our logic was to run our sergeants, our, super, our frontline supervisors through the training first to expose them to the type of event that they could uh, respond to and have to manage uh, until uh, jurisdictional police could attend and supplement uh, resources at a critical incident. So with the sergeants and acting sergeants having that experience from the exercise, they could then translate that or carry that experience with them into a, a larger exercise involving all of the constables. Uh, so really it enhances their supervisor, supervisory ability to manage a critical incident. And one other question in regards to the brochure, which I thought was really interesting. When you're trying to get people to remember a phone number, particularly in an emergency situation, is that also going to be available online? So if people go onto a website, that that brochure would be available online? I don't know if that's our current plan, but I can certainly follow up with, yeah. uh, okay. with that. I think, it would, you know, with, with this generation, paper's not that interesting to them, sure. but uh, online access, I think, would be valuable. Certainly. Yeah, yeah. Tony. Thanks for your report, Mike. I'm just wondering, in addition to the live exercises, do, do you guys also do tabletop exercises throughout the year as well? Yes, we do. And in fact, we ran one last fall, a tabletop exercise uh, along this, uh, a similar theme, a major incident. Uh, uh, the, the benefit of a live exercise, it, it allows all those principles learned at a tabletop exercise uh, to be uh, practiced in a simulated uh, scenario or event uh, at a a realistic location uh, such as Waterfront Station. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to move on to item number five on our agenda now, which is the Finance and Audit Committee report. And I'm going to turn it over to Tony as the committee chair to provide his report. Thank Great. you. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as usual, we had a, a very full agenda, so I don't have the time to, to speak to all the items. Uh, but I will provide some highlights. Uh, first, there are four reports under the uh, consent agenda. Um, two of them deal with the major projects, obviously the Broadway extension and the south of, of Fraser Rapid Transit. Uh, work continues on both those projects uh, to get ready for the future procurement process. So as soon as approval is granted, uh, then we're ready to hit the road running with respect to the procurement process. Um, also including the consent agenda is the Patella Bridge uh, Condition Monitoring Report. And as you know, we continue to monitor, inspect the bridge to ensure that it is safe to use. And all is good on that front. And then the last item is uh, the revised capital uh, project approval policy, which the committee reviewed and recommended to the board. So unless there are objections or questions, uh, we would then accept those items under consent agenda. Any concerns yeah. or questions, Marcella? I just have one question on the Patilla report, and I know it's not in the report normally, but are there planned any planned closures this summer? 
on the patrol every year there's closures. Are there? No planned closures. Ah, I see first year and years. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sandy. If, if we have any Okay, so hearing no further questions in regards to the consent agenda, we'll assume that those have carried. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, the committee also received an update on the uh, station upgrades project. And as you know, this program covers the update of seven stations on the Expo line. Uh, four of those stations, uh, which are basically substantially complete, the other three stations will be completed by the end of this year or early next year. Um, as you can appreciate, this work is very challenging because the construction is undertaking while the stations are still operational. And so uh, that makes for uh, an environment in terms of that uh, can cause issues. And, uh, we did learn some lessons in some of our early work, which we applied to the work on the later uh, stations. Um, but as you know, we had some issues on the commercial Broadway. Uh, as There's a train tracks that run adjacent to the station. The historical pattern was that there would be two trains a day that would uh, that would be on those tracks. Uh, when we started constructions, it, it actually uh, increased in terms of the train frequency to about eight to ten. From a safety perspective, every time a train runs by the uh, uh, the station, we had to stop construction, uh, put tools down. So that did have an impact in terms of the budget. So management is actually preparing a report, which will be brought back to the committee. And uh, we will bring that forward to the next board meeting, uh, which gives you a, a full summary of all the issues on that project. Um, also, uh, the committee reviewed the development cost uh, charges bylaw, and Rob is going to speak to that later, so I really won't get into all, all the details, but uh, uh, the committee was comfortable with the uh, bylaw as drafted. The um, committee also had a chance to review the progress on the 37 projects in our IT, 2018 IT plan. Um, there continues to be a really an increased focus in protecting TransLink from cybersecurity threats. Very active program in place to uh, protect uh, TransLink from these threats that are, that are still underway. Um, we also talked about or received a report on the open payments, which Kevin, I think, has has uh, discussed, so I won't go into too much detail, other than the fact that the committee was pleased with the low number of sort of card clashes. And I think a large part of that was really the effective communication program that we had in place before implementation uh, to sort of inform our customers about the card clash issue. Um, next, we dealt with the Enterprise Risk Management Program. As you know, that program is very active. Uh, we have 10 risks that we've identified. Uh, there are treatment plans that are in place to sort of mitigate those risks. Uh, the positive news is that the trend uh, for all those risks are either stable or decreasing. And so that's very encouraging. Um, we also received a report on our 2018-2019 Enterprise Insurance Program. As you know, this is a very complex program. There's a component of self-insurance in that program. Uh, the, the premiums are significant but they are appropriate in light of our business risks and uh, the extensive operations that we've undertaken. Uh, really the only increase from year to year over year has been with our uh, ICBC costs and of course everyone in the lower mainland is aware that ICBC costs have been increasing uh, year over year. Uh, we also uh, reviewed the quarterly real estate report. Uh, key highlights included the uh, completion of recent board approved acquisition. The team continues to work very hard, both with the City of Surrey to assess the over 200 property impacts associated with the Surrey LRT. And we're also working very closely with the City of Vancouver to assess the over 50 property impacts associated with the delivery of the rapid transit uh, project in Vancouver. Um, lastly, the committee reviewed the financial plan that will be part of the 2018-2027 investment plan. Uh, we reviewed sort of the projected revenues, the expenditures, uh, including an assessment of sort of the possible risks within the plan, as well as the risk mitigation measures that are currently in place or risk mit mit mitigation measures that we can implement depending on how uh, the pro forma financial forecast goes. It's an unprecedented plan, as Kevin mentioned, $10.5 billion in capital. 
And while Trans, uh, TransLink is receiving a significant senior government funding, we will need to increase our debt limit from $4 billion to $5.5 billion to cover the regional share of those capital expenditures. Uh, last point, uh, the committee had a chance to review the accountability report, which obviously Rob went through in the open meeting. The people component of this report uh, did go through the HR uh, committee, um, and the Finance and Audit Committee had a chance to review the complete report. Um, it's uh, it's a, and its approach, I think, which the committee uh, um, was encouraged by in terms of the approach, and so uh, uh, we provided some positive uh, feedback in terms of the report. Although management is prepared to take any feedback with respect to the process, uh, so that uh, we can incorporate that next year when we uh, when we also provide uh, or work on the report. So that, Madam Chair, is my uh, report, unless there's any questions. Thank you very much, Tony. Are there any questions before we invite Rob up to do the the DCC presentation? Okay, well, why don't, uh, Rob, why don't you come up and you can do your next part of this, uh, this section. Welcome. Remember to turn on your little red light. Thanks. Okay, so uh, the development cost charges are presented here simply for information as they will be attached uh, as an appendice to the investment plan, uh, the phase two investment plan. Um, as you can see in the summary, the drafting of the, of the DCC uh, draft bylaws is consistent with the previous work done by both the Mayor's Council and the Board and comments raised uh, through that process. And um, is uh, and we've also outlined the process in terms of uh, it'll come back to the board once it has gone through the um, uh, inspector uh, stage uh, with the province. And with that, I'll I'll just take any questions or comments related to the report. Any questions for Rob in relation to the DCCs? I know we've been talking about this at the both both the committee levels, so I know there's been. Uh, quite a robust conversation about this, but this is the last opportunity. Uh, if there's any other questions for the board members, from the board members for Rob in regards to uh, this report, Karen. Thank you. Rob, we don't have any, um, any further information on the potential to update annually for uh, inflation at this point, do we, other than what's in the report? Um, I don't believe so. Jeff, do you... Uh do you recall if there's an inflationary index in the report? Uh, it does grow actually by inflation. Uh, there's an index that allows us to grow it by about 2% per year, and then every three years we have to look at the rates again to understand that they're if coming close to what the targets are. Yeah, it sounded like that was our understanding. Do we have any further? Is that? Yeah, yeah. that allows for that. Great, thank you. Great. And Richard. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the um, I notice in the in the report it indicates that we're um, planning for DCC collections to start January fifteenth, two thousand twenty. Um, is is that date uh, just driven by our best expectations of legislation passing and and the infrastructure being put together, or is if if we're ready earlier, well, could that be moved up, or consequently, if there's challenges, could it be pushed back? Like what what's the magic of that particular date? It's not like January first; it's January fifteenth. So. I, I believe, uh, well, actually, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Who, yeah. So, Mayor Walton, Mr. Chair, um, we, in discussions with the development sector, with the stakeholders, including all the municipalities, we developed a uh, working group to look at this. And one of the things that the development sector had asked for is some certainty up front about when it would come in, and especially okay. as it would impact properties that are already owned and the performance on that. Giving about a year, year and a half notice was preferred and we were able to accommodate that. Uh, the January 15th was a recognition that we put January 1st, that often impacts what municipalities are doing when their changes come in. So we don't want to have a flood of uh, applications coming in all in uh, one or two days. Uh, so that was a collaboration between both the municipalities uh, and the, the um, consultation with the developments. Is this all the applications are going to come in on January 13th and 14th then? You mean to say, okay. Exactly. Okay. Stand by this channel, right? Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Rob and or Jeff? Because Jeff seems to be jumping in on this as well. All right. Well, hearing none, 
Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Okay, so I think, Tony, that ends the uh, your report. Is that correct? Okay. All right, so then we're going to move on to the Planning and Stakeholder Relations Committee. And uh, Larry Beasley, as I mentioned earlier, is traveling, and Murray Dinwiddie is going to present his report on his behalf. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so we had also had a very busy uh, uh, committee meeting. Uh, we received a number of program updates and discussed several policy initiatives. Um, several of those are going to be discussed um, subsequently by um, Jeff Cross. Those include transit service guidelines, uh, project partnership agreements related to the two major projects, um, rail projects that um, will be included in phase two investment plan, area transport plan program update, and an update on custom transit service delivery review implementation. So those will be coming up after I finish uh, my remarks. Um, in relation to uh, other items that the committee discussed, the phase two investment plan preparation process um, um, was discussed at the committee level. Um, uh, Kevin's already provided an update on that, so I won't go into that. Pets on transit policy review, it's something that we've heard at this board by way of delegations asking us to look at uh, changing our policy with respect to pets being allowed on uh, the transit system. The board's directed staff to uh, identify and evaluate alternative policy considerations and approaches related to expanding access for customers traveling with pets on the transit system. Um, the objective is to make it easier for customers to travel with pets, um, which, since we know this is an issue for customers. At the same time, we've heard that allowing more animals on board may create conflicts and issues for other riders. So um, at this point in time, staff are currently working through options and intend to bring back a further, uh, more uh, refined um, uh, report to the committee uh, in the fall. Um, washrooms on transit uh, policy review as well was discussed at the committee. Um, the board had directed staff to um, identify and evaluate alternative policy considerations and approaches related to providing uh, expanded washroom access along the transit system. Right now it's very limited. Um, Washroom access is something that many of our customers have indicated would help improve their experience and make it more convenient to choose transit, especially for longer trips, and I think it's pretty self-evident. However, providing washroom access along the system comes at a cost and introduces risks that will need to be carefully managed. So any policy that we develop needs to, um, to balance these considerations. Uh, staff are continuing to develop more refined policy options built on an approach where responsibility for providing washrooms may include a mix of uh, being provided by TransLink and being provided by uh, the private sector. So the objective here is to um, look for ways to provide uh, better access to, um, uh, to washrooms for our, our customers uh, and at the same time ensuring that it's effic efficient and safe. So staff will be bringing back to the committee a further report on that um, later this fall. We also discussed regional the regional transportation strategy update. Um, the current RTS was approved in 2013. Legislation requires that it be updated every five years. Um, in fact, we've, um, we've uh, uh, passed a temporary uh, extension to the current RTS to allow for the current um, updating process to uh, uh, take a place in an orderly and um, and uh, proper manner. So uh, the current RTS will remain in place until the new RTS is complete. At this point in time, uh, it's it's just getting underway. Um, the first uh, element of the process was to meet with elected officials this last week, and uh, there will be um, uh, about an 18-month process to update the RTS. Um, the public will become, uh, or will have an opportunity to become engaged in the process later this year or early, early in 2019. And we're really looking at uh, an RTS that um, isn't incremental, it's more quantum in nature, I believe, uh, given the changes that are occurring in uh, the transportation sector from a technology perspective. Um, it's clear that um, there are new waves coming that need to be addressed in the next RTS. Cons consultation on the new B lines was also an item discussed at the committee. There are four new B lines being planned uh, across the region. Um, the committee received an update on their implementation. Um, it's great. It was good to see the extent of community involvement that um, occurred online and in, in person through engagement that uh, staff has uh, undertaken. Um, 
We heard that staff is working closely with the municipalities to implement measures uh, by the fall of 2019 when these new beelines are intended to go into operation to ensure that they'll be launched in a way that will be reliable and in fact create um, an enhanced uh, um, experience for our customers, especially in terms of timing in comparison to the alternatives that would be available to them uh, for the trips that they'll be taking. Um, late night service review, um, SkyTrain service review uh, was discussed at the committee as well. The committee heard an update on planning and consultation on this in initiative. TransLink is continuing with its technical study of late night SkyTrain service and, and will continue to discuss with stakeholders opportunities for improving late night um, transit service, particularly in the uh, Granville Street Entertainment District. Um, so. Um, that's uh, an ongoing study. Uh, the committee will continue to be engaged with that, but uh, there are some, um, I believe, some uh, means that will be implemented uh, or are being reviewed for being implemented that will help with that situation, separate and apart from SkyTrain service uh, being extended um, to longer hours during the day. But we're, uh, we're continuing to review the implications of extending SkyTrain service as well. Staff also provided, um, uh, the committee understood and, uh, and uh, received information from staff regarding uh, TransLink input to Metro Vancouver on a couple of um, regional growth strategy amendments that are being proposed in um, Port Moody and, and in Surrey that um, will have an effect on TransLink if they're approved. So the, um, uh, it's uh, important to recognize that um, TransLink does have an important role to play in relation to helping uh, understand the implication of uh, changes to the regional growth strategy as well. And, um, and the, uh, these two particular uh, proposals are at locations where um, it would, um, it would uh, cause significant, uh, have significant in implications to TransLink if they were to be approved. So I think um, I'll leave it at that. If there are any questions, I'll take them. Any questions for Murray in regards to his report before we invite Jeff up here? All right, well, hearing none, Jeff, please come to the hot seat. And you've got five reports, oh, four reports you're delivering to us today. Is that correct, Jeff? I believe so. Okay. So, uh, Chair, I'll start with the uh, transit service guidelines. Uh, it's in your package, both the memo and the actual guidelines that uh, we've recently completed. Uh, just a couple of key highlights on what these are and why they're important. Uh, they were last updated about 14 years ago, I think, in 2004. Um, actually, it's very relevant to the conversation that we heard uh, that you had today, including one of the delegations. They provide a lot of uh, guidance for us. They're not, they're not strict, like they are guidelines, not standards, but it's really on a network focus. It looks at a whole bunch of things. The example that happens to be there is stop spacing, which is of key um, interest to our customers, and that's a focus that we look on, look at. But it's not just about each route, it's looking at the network to ensure that we have the right stop spacing, both for the sort of peak services, express services, and then the underlying local. Um, these guidelines are really important both for us and on how we plan our services and how we bring forward um, where we believe modifications, expansion should be, et cetera. They are also in incredibly important for the municipalities as they think about their land use and what the expectations would be for different transit services that come out of these. They are adaptable and they're flexible. We've been adapting them over time. We had actually started working on certain components, whether it be overcrowding uh, or about frequency and span that has helped inform the service expansion that was included in the phase one and the phase two plan. So they're fairly extensive. Uh, they were developed in collaboration with our partners to make sure that we're meeting their needs and that they're usable both for municipalities, uh, that they're accessible to the public. It's not a key interface with the public, but there are certainly members of the public that are interested uh, the development sector, et cetera, to sort of understand uh, where TransLink is going with these things. These are the kind of key topics and principles and is the uh, underlying structure for the actual guidelines, uh, really looking at are we getting our services in the right place where the demand is sufficient? And this is one of the key areas where we've made 
a transformation compared to previously, uh, previous iterations. So really focusing on what kind of land use, what kind of both attributes, so we, the things we call the six Ds, so density of one is one of those, but diversity of uses and other things, how that will impact the likely demand. And we've also included thresholds for that. So if, if uh, your land use looks like this and these kinds of density of both population and jobs and these attributes, it's likely to warrant this type of service funding available, obviously, but that can helps with municipality, municipal planning and land use planning, uh, where before we were much looser on this. So if you're planning and looking to Mayor Walton, you're looking at Maplewood Farms development, they can look at this and understand what kind of thresholds will we need to meet and when to justify whether it be um, peak service or uh, FTN frequent transit or even a beeline or above. So those kinds of things, that's a real um, uh, progression for these guidelines. Then the middle sense around useful service, these are the things that are really important to the passenger to make sure that it's comfortable, convenient, etc. And then finally that the outcomes that we're getting out of this, so that both from a cost effect effectiveness perspective, from outcomes for economic development and accessibility, all of those things are balanced. So that's what's covered in the guidelines. We're, as I mentioned, we're already using them. Uh, they've informed the investment plans. One of my uh, next items is the Southwest Area Transport Plan. We used some of these to uh, influence what the prospective projects were and what we should be focusing on, all the service change analysis that we've been doing. And it, it uh, weaves into the transit service performance review that we're now doing on an annual basis as well. So that's my report, Chair. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions for Jeff in regards to his report? I know this was a lot of work, Jeff, and uh, I think that it's going to be an amazingly useful tool for you going forward. So kudos to you and your team for putting that together. Karen. I can't let you go without a question about, the, um, uh, about this because I thought, I agree, a huge amount of work and incredibly interesting to read, actually. Um, I, I just had a question. Um, I know that you look at the type of, it's not just the vehicle, but the type of trip in terms of service guidelines and capacity and all of those um, types of, of metrics. Um, when you're looking at vehicle capacity, um, when you call something a highway coach, does that refer to the vehicle itself or is it the vehicle and the route? So like 620, for example, which yeah. has a lot of highway <coughs> component, does that sort of fall into that? Uh, so, yeah, the vehicle type kind of dictates what the passenger load would be, and so your, how many people, what their boarding situation um, will be, and like a, um, a highway coach, because of the nature of that service where you are mainly primarily seated passengers, that will have a certain capacity. So the, in certain situations, the vehicle is really relevant. In yeah. other situations, it's more about the kind of service and then matching the vehicle to that, the capacity, whether it be a 40-foot or a 60-foot articulated or a community shuttle. Previous iterations of our transit service guidelines actually um, focused more on what the, um, the vehicle was and we've recognized that that was too constraining and in some situations you might have a community shuttle on a route during the off-peak periods and then you would put a 40-footer into that. So we didn't want to define the service that way. We wanted to better match uh, capacity with demand. Right, so you kind of answered the second part of my question, which was because when you have something like the 620 on a highway, it might not be that kind of coach, but it might have those kinds of constraints. So that was my question, whether you were able to, to sort of differentiate that. So that's, that's great, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Any other questions before he moves on to the second report, which is the project partnership agreements? And this is just here for our uh, verbal report and information at this point in time, correct, It is. Jeff? We had originally intended this uh, to be distributed in four direction. Uh, we are, as part of my update, uh, we are very close on these. Just stepping back um, as a reminder, so the partnership agreements were established as a concept within the Mayor's vision. Uh, with the objective being to put these partnerships and agree uh, agreements into place at the time of funding for major initiatives, whether they be rapid transit or potentially uh, a bridge or beeline infrastructure, 
to, in, to increase the certainty of getting the outcomes that we want for those investments. So um, in the case of the two that we're advancing right now for with the city of Surrey and with the city of Vancouver, associated with the rapid transit extension and the LRT respectively. So it, these um, are a way of identifying all the actions that each agency will undertake to maximize the outcomes. So the, the partnership agreements will cover things like all the planning activities, that each municipality is committing to undertake. Uh, we don't know the outcomes of that. We can't bind future councils to what those look like, but committing to the processes and the policies, prioritizing development in those corridors, et cetera, establishing monitoring and evaluation uh, parties and bodies in a, at a regular basis to see how things are going. Do we need to adjust course uh, so that we're get, getting the ridership we're getting the land use development, the economic activity that we're all aspiring uh, for for those projects. The other component of those are the contributions that each municipality and TransLink are making to the projects, specifically as it relates to property rights or title or strategic right of way. Uh, so that that's clear um, as we go into the onset of these. In the case of Vancouver, as was identified as part of the discussion guide for the next investment plan, there are also some new commercial activity rights that we're establishing in that that will allow for a new revenue stream that will increase their contribution and offset some of the costs for the um, Millennium Line Broadway extension. So there are um, both, there are basically two components with each agreement. Uh, we have signed off with the City of Surrey staff is um, going to be recommending those. Uh, we have one of the two with the City of Vancouver. We're hoping to land that by tomorrow. Our objective is to include those on uh, Monday for distribution to the board in advance of the investment plan uh, consideration for adoption next Thursday. Uh, the, the agreements are actually between TransLink and the municipalities, so they would, uh, we're proposing they would be executed by the CEO with those municipalities, but approved by the board and brought forward at the time of the investment plan to the Mayor's Council. So we're really pleased. We've been working on the concept. It, it actually came forward in the last regional transportation strategy to make sure that these assets and investments that the region is making get the most certainty of outcomes and on a timely basis. Um, they eventually come. We're seeing that on the Millennium Line uh, right now in the Evergreen, but we want those to be quicker and, and dependable and get the uh, ridership and the productivity that underpins uh, those major investments. So with that, I'll take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Any questions for Jeff in regards to this report? Jeff, I'm curious, um, have you considered using a, using a version of this report for a beeline investment? That is the intention. So there are three, frame, three kind of levels that you would get into. A uh, memo of understanding was signed between us and the two cities in this particular case. That just set out the framework by which we we're going to discuss it. Then these partnership agreements that identify who's doing what, that applies to the beeline. So we're, we're, that is the intention that we would develop those for each of the corridors. There are 11 municipalities that would be involved in the first four. A lot of the infrastructure that we would be bringing forward would be on their property. You know, we co-manage with them the MRN, uh, but they actually own those. So getting it clear what, who does what will be important. Great. And just a follow-up question, would you go back to those who have B-lines now and try and establish agreements with them? Uh, that might be the case. We have uh, proposed infrastructure funding for the existing B-Line, like the 95 B-Line, uh, as well as potentially the 99 for some components. Uh, and the 96 B-Line unlikely, given that we'll be transitioning that into an LRT line. Uh, but there's also proposed to be in the Phase 2 program a matching uh, infrastructure fund for B-Lines to continually upgrade them. If we get into a situation where they're applying for that funding, we might bring that forward. Great, thank you. Tony. Um, yeah, thanks, Jeff. So the uh, transit service guidelines that has the productivity measures, potentially in, when you're talking to uh, these agreements on the B lines, would we be able to maybe put targets in terms of uh, that they would agree to try and, and either uh, cooperate so we reach these targets or work with TransLink so that those targets are achieved? 
Uh, in concept, yes, that's what we're pushing for. So understanding what's already committed in uh, official community plans, uh, what's in the regional growth strategy as far as population employment, but what corridor planning that the different munis municipalities are going to do. So design matters and on the ground. Um, it's not just the, the growth sort of density you're getting, it's how it's placed, the parking management, all of those kinds of things we'd out like to outline in those so that we're likely to get certain higher levels of productivity, cost effectiveness, which then is a virtuous cycle that we can put more service into it. Great, thanks. Well, Jeff, let's move on to 6.4, your area trans transport plan. Thank you. A uh, very quick item, so we just wanted to update you on a few things that we're undertaking in this realm. Uh, these used to be uh, area transit plans. We do them on a periodic basis. Uh, I think for seven, we've kind of divided the region into about seven different regions, subregions. Uh, this provides us a, a more granular level of detail than what's in the region in our regional transportation strategy. Identifies the priorities for the next 10 to 15 years on how the network will um, run, not just the transit network, but how it interacts with the regional cycling, with the major road network, and in this uh, most recent iteration, including looking at goods movement as well. Uh, so the, the Southwest Area Transport Plan was our most recent update. It was just endorsed and approved by the City of Richmond, City of Delta, and the Tawasim First Nations. That will then um, stand as our uh, guidance, our blueprint by which we draw the priorities from for funding. We're already doing that. Some of the projects that came forward as part of the community consultation and work with those municipalities have been the initial investments from the phase one and also for the phase two plan. Uh, they go down to every route that we would look at changing and they give them some level of prioritization, high, medium, low. Um, but you might that doesn't mean you go from highest to low. They're just, uh, you might pick different ones for different objectives, but we've identified what the objective of each one of those things would be, including uh, a sort of a timing of how you overhaul the network. So we've just completed this one. We are now well into uh, the initial consultation for the Maple Ridge and Pitt Meadows area transport plan, which we felt was really important to undertake with the introduction of the new B-line uh, along Lougheed, which will dramatically shift the nature of the network there. So we are um, already completed the first round of engagement and been out with councils on that, hoping to complete that part in 2019. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Murray. Jeff, just on, uh, in relation to the uh, program of updating these area transport plans over time, they're a 10 to 15 year time horizon. So um, would it be one every couple of years would be updated? Is that kind of the objective? That, that is the objective. This one took longer than we would have liked, um, partly because of things like the plebiscite and uh, the phase one plan that got just the, just a resource and a, a bandwidth um, perspective that we had to deal with. Uh, we'd also like to find a way to uh, streamline them, but it's interesting once you engage with the community and the councils and they start rolling their sleeves up, it, that, that process of just consultation going through the iterations takes a fair bit of time. But if we can get them into the year, year and a half zone, then we could be doing basically cycling through all of these so that About they're fresh. Years or yeah. something like that. The, uh, the objective of sort of how these area plans tie in with the RTS, I guess, is also a bit challenging given that we're updating the RTS and uh, in some respects um, they're hand in glove. Yes. Uh, so the, I, I suspect that once we get through the RT, um, the regional transportation strategy update, there probably will be needing uh, amendments needed to some of the area plans to reflect the new thinking that comes out of that. Absolutely, and in the case of the Southwest Area Transport Plan, if while it only had a 10 to, not only, it had a 10 to 15 year horizon, also recognized that some of the desires for more express, even rapid transit um, consideration in the future. So those might show up on the, on the end of the horizon that we would then consider in the new regional transportation strategy. Thank you. Any other questions for Jeff? 
Jeff, I just want to say that um, time and time again when we see you for meetings, all I hear about is what, what next meeting you've been at, what evening council meeting you've been at, or what public consultation. So I just want to really commend you and your team for all the work that you've been doing and uh, in being out in the community and hearing, hearing the, uh, the feedback. Thank you. It's a, it's essential, and it's really it's the only way to kind of understand what the the local needs are to be out there, including taking transit to uh, Pitt Meadows during a peak hour and kind of understanding where those pinch points are. Uh, we have a great team that's covering the whole region on this. Yeah, um, Anne has something. I just want to. I know this involves a lot of evenings and weekends, so I want to pass on thanks to your wife too <laughs> <laughs> for sharing you. <laughs> I'll pass that along. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Jeff, I think this is your last report for this section, and this is uh, on custom transit service delivery. Yeah, uh, Chair, I don't have uh, any slides on this one. Um, we the the report is in there, and we have been committed to continue to update you on the progress that we're making on, I believe, 37 different um, recommendations that came out of the Custom Transit Service Delivery Review. You heard from Hayden and Louise. Uh, you'll note in the report that a lot of the objectives that we're pursuing were in conversations with the new vendor and using that opportunity as they come online uh, later um, in 2019 or 2018 I should say that um, that's an opportunity to look at some of our, our software systems on some of our travel training our management of the taxi program etc so you'll see that we've also made significant progress on the travel training with CNBC on both designing it getting a manager of travel training then in place um, not consistent across all of the objectives there's a lot to take on so some have been a little bit slower and as we've learned more about it and dove into it, we've realized that there are sequencing to some of these things and so it might take a little bit longer than, than anticipated. But we're generally pleased with the progress. We're trying to maintain our stakeholder group and the outreach that was really um, informative and got us to this ag agreed consensus on what we needed to do. So engaging them on a regular basis through the user advisory committee, uh, through CNBC, having open houses with users to see how things are going, what their interests and concerns are. Uh, so we can continue to have this be a bit organic on what our actual strategy is to get there, but the objectives remain the same. So we'll just open it up to any questions. Um, Sarah Ross was supposed to be here. She's in another meeting, but Louise is here to help if there's any more sure. detailed questions. Well, I know we've had an opportunity to ask questions before, but is there anything else in um, regards to this, the policy piece in, in, uh, in this area of topic? Topic area? No? I think that Hayden and Louise kind of, you know, did yep, everything for you, Jeff. It's a collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> They've got to carry the heavy Good team. Load. All right. Well, that's where I was confused. I thought you were going to do all this under the one umbrella. But uh, so thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on to item number seven on, on our agenda, which is the Human Resources and Governance Committee. And I'm going to ask Ann Giardini as the committee chair to provide her report. Uh, thank you. And recognizing that I'm all that stands between people and either getting on with their busy lives or eating lunch, I'll try and be quick. Uh, uh, we have been busy on this committee, uh, primarily with the HR functions uh, for the first half of the year, with a view of focusing more in the second, in the next part of the year on uh, governance. Uh, ha having said that, we have um, uh, taken up some revisions to the board governance manual and a review of the articles. Now, uh, those items are on the consent agenda, as I understand it. So I'll ask if there's any questions before they are considered to have been adopted. Do we have any questions or comments from the group? Hearing none, then those revisions are considered to be adopted under the consent agenda. And I know that the committee did work on that. On, on this board manual, so I know a lot of the questions were dealt with there. Exactly, yes. yes. Yeah. There's been exactly. a prior discussion, a, a robust discussion exactly. of the changes. Thank you. But it does reflect in uh, a board governance manual and articles that are up to date and comprehensive. So I think that was work well done. Uh, we've discussed uh, amongst ourselves the importance of ongoing director education, uh, and uh, several of us have undertaken director education exercises during this, this uh, past few months. Uh, we continue to focus in this committee on um, 
uh, aspects of safety as they relate to human resources, although the safety for employees, uh, uh, contractors and others lies in the finance committee as a risk matter. Uh, we, we take up safety issues relating to human resources from time to time. Uh, and uh, we received several reports from the VPHR, including the VP's uh, quarterly report, an annual people report, which is always fun to read because we have interesting people doing interesting things. And importantly, um, a report on the people assumptions, the, the needs that there will be for people to, to carry out the 10-year plan. And that's an important piece of planning in order to make sure that as the work is required to be done, the people that can do the work are available to us. Uh, and um, we've also undertaken <coughs> a review and revision and propose uh, a new respectful workplace policy. Uh, it's no news to any of us that a respectful workplace is uh, something that we need to assure uh, anyone that comes into or deals with uh, translate people. So there's been an extensive revision to the uh, prior policy uh, and a, I think, well-advised and well-constructed new policy has been put forward, which the board has been given an opportunity to review. The committee has approved and recommended the new policy for approval by this board, uh, and I would like to uh, put that forward as a motion to this board for a decision at this meeting. Okay, thank you, Marcella. And I'll call for the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Carrie, thank you. Uh, that's my report. Thank you very much. Well, I think that that calls to uh, conclusion our board meeting, so I'm going to um, call for a motion to adjourn the meeting, and, um, and we will thank everybody for attending, and, and um, we'll see you all in September. Thank you very much.